Morning everybody, my name is Lara Walsh. I'm a placement student at Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful and I'm also two years into my marine biology degree at Queen's University Belfast and I've been asked today to do a webinar on biodiversity and uh, the threats to biodiversity and what we can do to improve the biodiversity in our local area. So I'm just going to share my screen now. Okay. So, so notes. Okay, so like I said, this is going to be a webinar on biodiversity in our local area. We're going to mainly focus on small mammals and birds, but we will cover uh, things like insects as well because they all do link together. There's going to be three main concepts that I want to introduce to you first before I start talking about individual species. This is the ecosystem, diversity and ecosystem services. So an ecosystem, as you can see here, it is the community of living organisms and abiotic environmental factors which are interacting with each other. So we're talking about all the different species that we have interacting with their environment and all the different relationships that they have. And these ecosystems can get very complicated. There's a lot of different species, especially when you've got a lot of diversity. But the ecosystem is an incredibly important part of our natural world. Diversity creates a resilient ecosystem. So lots of different species in high abundance means our ecosystem can respond well to changes in the environment. And why do we need our ecosystems to be resilient? Because of the services that those ecosystems provide. Uh, we're talking here about things like pollination, seed dispersal, pest control, there's multiple other services, but these are the three main ones I'll focus on today. But these services are really important to us, our species, human beings, our societies, as well as just the natural world. So it's really important that we keep our ecosystems resilient to change and uh, we support the diversity that we have. So another concept I kind of wanted to introduce to you was food chains or food webs. So what we have here is a very simple food chain, just made up of three levels. We've got our blackberries, which will be the producer to the plant. We have got the mouse in the middle, which would consume the blackberries, and then the owl on the end, which would consume the mouse. Food chains are often a lot more complicated than this. They end up being webs with lots of different transfers of uh, food between each level. But the important thing to note here is if there is a change in the population of one of the species which is in our food chain or food web, it can have serious effects on the population of other species which can either be above or below it in the food chain. For example, if we somehow get a decline in our uh, wood mouse population, the owl population may suffer if that is its only food source. So again, this reinforces the importance of having a very resilient, diverse ecosystem to allow species to adapt to these changes. Unfortunately, we are experiencing a serious period of biodiversity decline, especially in the UK. The UK is actually the most nature depleted country in Europe. So we are losing our species at a terrific rate and it's not good. And the main causes of this biodiversity decline, you can see there are habitat loss, road traffic deaths, pesticide use and climate change. So if we start with land use, uh, habitat loss, the main cause of this is land use change. So uh, previously untouched environments such as woodland or wetlands or grassland, things like that, being changed into usually farmland or uh, for urbanization or urban sprawl. So that the spreading out of cities and towns to create residential areas, ripping up that habitat and creating areas where these species cannot survive. There are no food sources from them. There's no places for them to live. So uh, kind of similar to this, we have road traffic deaths. We've got an expansion of roads across the country um, road traffic deaths are a serious cause of human loss of life, but also uh, animal loss of life as well. Pesticide use is a serious one. Often farmers will use herbicides, pesticides to keep weeds and other insect pests off their crops. 
Um, but often these pesticides are not targeting a single species. They can move through the food chain. So if you are targeting specific insects, maybe birds which eat those insects, the uh, chemicals can pass on to them. And we have something called biomagnification or bioaccumulation, where the levels of this toxin or chemical can increase in its concentration up the food chain. So actually the uh, species which can be most at risk from this kind of pollution are apex predators, predators right at the top of the food chain, mainly our birds of prey. And this happened with DDT in the mid 20th century. DDT uh, was a widely used pesticide on lots of different crops. And it was banned, I think, in the 1970s as a result of the serious environmental degradation that was caused by it. And the main reason for this was the effect it had on birds of prey. It was found to thin eggshells in birds of prey. It disrupted uh, reproductive behavior and had effects on uh, male reproductive systems as well. So it was banned as a result of this, but there's plenty of other pesticides and herbicides out there that are having similar effects today. And our last one is climate change. We may think climate change is a while off affecting us, but it is affecting our country and our species right now. Um, this is usually through changes in weather patterns. Once predictable weather patterns are becoming more unpredictable, our rain is becoming less frequent at some times and more frequent at others. And this is throwing species out of sync with each other. If you have a pollinator species and the plant that it pollinates, Changes in weather systems and temperature can throw these two out of sync. So perhaps the uh, pollinator species emerges when the pollinator plant is not there. So we have species emerging from hibernation or being spawned and there's no food sources for them. So climate change is another serious reason why we are experiencing a biodiversity decline in our country. So. I'm sure you'll all be thinking now, how can we help with this? So I've got three ways you could help with your own back garden or a small space that you have outside. You can see here on the left, we've got a bird box. Uh, bird boxes, you need to make sure that you've got a nice clear flight path into the box that you want it facing roughly north to east uh, to keep it out of the wettest kind of rains and also to allow full exposure to the sun. Just gonna have to pause here. Okay, so if I start again, we have the bird box here uh, on the left. If you're putting up a bird box in your back garden, we need to make sure that you've got a nice clear flight path into that bird box. You want it facing roughly north to east in, order, in that orientation in order to keep the entrance away from the wettest rains uh, and the coldest of winds, but also to allow it to get plenty of sun to warm it up as well. You also want to keep it nice and high up, uh, a tree or a wall or wherever you're putting it, and you don't want it to be in a place where things like uh, domestic cats might be able to get out of the box. A bog hotel, we're talking about a similar thing. We need a clear flight path. We want it facing south. We need plenty of sun to keep it nice and warm to warm up uh, whatever insects are inside. And in the winter, you can change out a lot of the material uh, for fresh stuff. And uh, usually solitary bees will use these hotels, but other things will use them as well. And uh, finally, we have the bat box. You should put the bat box where you see bats frequently. Uh, you see them flying around. Uh, this is usually on tree lines or hedges, nice and high up, even about four meters up, again, out the way of any spaces where a cat might be able to get there, for example, nice clear flight path. And crucially, it needs to be away from any artificial light sources. So if you have uh, a lamppost in your back garden or in the front of your house, you need to keep the bat box away from that. You need it to be in a nice dark area. So another thing that we can do is we can plant up wildflowers, creating a nectar cafe is how it's referred to. So if we've got plenty of pollinator plants in our back garden and in our outdoor spaces, we'll encourage more insects to come to our garden. And these insects can form the basis of a food chain so we can attract birds, small mammals into our garden because of this. 
So I've got some examples here. There's a the link at the bottom there is a list of a really nice detailed um, list of plants that you could plant in your garden specific to say the amount of sunlight you get and how cold it is and where you live and how much time you have to devote to that nectar cafe. There's some very hands off stuff and there's some stuff that will need a little bit more um, attention, let's say. So we have some examples here, primrose, rudbeckia, budlia, lavender. Uh, and if you plant up a nice diverse range of these flowers and make sure that there are going to be things flowering all throughout from the spring to the autumn to cover as much time as possible. We don't want a nectar cafe, which is really only available for one or two months of the year. We want to spread it out. So uh, another thing, what do we do if we find a fledgling bird? So a fledgling bird would be a chick which uh, is just about to fledge, just about to leave the nest. Perhaps it's fallen out a little bit early. Um, often if you find a chick on the floor, the parents will not be very far away and that chick will be absolutely fine. So I would recommend just leaving it. Um, it's very hard to tell exactly where the chick has come from. And if you put it back in the wrong nest, that could have some serious consequences for the chicks that are already in the nest. Um, sometimes the parent or bird will notice if one of their chicks is sick or unhealthy in some way and deliberately remove it from the nest in which case you really shouldn't put it back the mother has uh, mother or father has removed the chick for a reason and you should just leave it um, only put it back if the chick looks very healthy and you are absolutely sure about which nest it has fallen out of but my top advice would be just to leave it the parents will be close by so on a similar vein, what should I do if I find a grounded or an injured bat? So bats are very common in Northern Ireland. We have about eight or nine species of bats here, and it's not uncommon to find a uh, grounded bat, which is just a bat that's out in the daytime on the ground. Maybe it's exhausted or it might be injured as well. So the two main things you've got to remember here, I've got them on the, the slide, is you should never release a bat in the daylight and you should never handle a bat in bare hands, you should always put gloves on. Uh, so one of the things that might happen is you might end up with a live bat trapped inside your house, in which case you should try and guide it into a small room and leave the window or the door of that room open into the, uh, in the outside. But of course, only do this if it's nighttime. If it's daytime, you need to try and trap the bat in uh, some kind of box with air holes in and pop it in a nice dark, warm room, maybe with some water, perhaps some food, some very finely chopped up cat or dog food, I think is okay for bats. Um, so you can pop them in there. If it's injured, you need to contact a vet so it can receive some kind of treatment and then it can be safely released. But again, if you find a bat, don't release it during the daytime and don't handle it with bare hands. You need to have some gloves on. And if you need some more advice or information on what to do, the Northern Ireland Bat Group is a brilliant resource and I would definitely recommend going to check out their website. So hedgehogs. Hedgehogs are small nocturnal mammals. They have about 7,000 spines on them and they are getting increasingly rare around uh, the UK. So they uh, can often be found in your garden and if you would like to feed them, that's perfectly fine. It's a myth that you should give them bread and milk. Uh, they're actually lactose intolerant, so giving them milk is not a good idea, and the bread is nutritionally deficient. There are plenty of other good things that you can give to that hedgehog. Chopped up dog or cat food, wet dog or cat food is really good. You can also buy specific hedgehog food from the pet shop. So if you do have a hedgehog in your back garden and you would like to look after it, you can put out some food like that. You can also make a shelter for the hedgehog. This means that the food that you're putting out will be eaten just by the hedgehog. You're not letting other things like birds or cats get at it. So you can create, uh, you can buy a shelter that's been pre-made or you can make one. I have made one from scratch uh, and you can put it in your back garden if you have a hedgehog uh, and they will be perfectly fine and they will come in and they will eat. So I've got here, if you find a hoglet, so a baby hedgehog, um, you can find these in the spring and the summer. Often around the autumn time, if you find one, that hoglet will need some sort of help because there's not much food around. It will probably be quite tired. Uh, if the hoglet's looking tired or distressed, pick it up obviously with gloves because it's spiky. Uh, you can put it on a little hot water bottle and then call the vets or the local hedgehog rescue center to get that hedgehog sorted out and some good help. 
So on a bit of a personal note, uh, I had a hedgehog in our back garden last year. I went home because of the COVID-19 pandemic cancelled all of my uni classes. And I came back from walking the dog early in the morning and I saw on the left there this little hedgehog. Well, it's not very little, actually. It was quite a big, big hedgehog uh, coming back home from a long night. Not sure what he was up to. Uh, and we, my parents saw the hedgehog a few more times. Usually you'll see them early in the morning or at dusk. You won't see them in broad daylight, really. Uh, and then so on the right here is a hedgehog shelter that I built just from some old stuff that was lying around the back of the house. And we put the hedgehog food in there. And you could go and watch the hedgehog go in there. And, and he was very happy to feed uh, in there and eat, take his fill and then toddle off and do whatever else he was doing in the nighttime. So that's just a little personal thing that I had last year. And I, I hope that if you do end up having a hedgehog in your back garden, that you can put together something like this as well. And the reason why is that it's really important that we do as much as we can to help out our hedgehog populations. So you can see here, there was an estimated 30 million hedgehogs in Britain throughout the 1950s. And now that number is thought to be less than 1 million. And while hedgehog numbers are declining across the country, they're actually declining at a slower rate in urban areas, cities and towns because of the things that people are doing in their back garden. A main thing is the Hedgehog Highway, a campaign that's been going across England. I think it's in Scotland, Wales as well. Um, people are just sort of digging little holes or cutting holes in fences uh, in their back garden to allow little paths or highway for the hedgehogs to go through and expand their um, territory. So surely some of the stuff that we are doing in our back garden, like you'll see in this video, is really helping out our hedgehog numbers. So I hope that maybe you can take it. Our next section for this webinar is going to be on predators and prey in Northern Ireland. So let's start with some prey. So a key prey species is the field mouse. Uh, they are also known as the wood mouse in other places as well, a bit confusingly. Tiny little mice, you can see how small they are just from that little ear of um, wheat that that mouse is on, how tiny they are. They're nocturnal, they're very shy, they're very secretive. It's quite uncommon that you would see them, but if you do, then you can tell the big difference between them and normal house mice because they have larger ears and much longer back legs to allow them to jump a lot further. Uh, they live in a wide variety of habitats. They will live in grassland, they will live in dry stone walls, they will live in wood, they will live in hedgerows. Um, but they're really, really important so to the ecosystem. So this is an example of an ecosystem service that they can provide, is that they make these extensive networks of burrows in which they will feed and in which they will reproduce and raise their young. What they also do is they store seeds and nuts in these burrows. And like all of us, field mice are a little bit forgetful. And sometimes they will forget where their store of nuts or seeds is. And these nuts and seeds can then germinate and they can become uh, saplings for trees or uh, shrubland for bushes and plants as well. So they can actually play a really important role in the regeneration of woodland. So they are a really important species to keep around through these. You might not think it, but the, the storages that they leave can regenerate woodland. So they're really important. Garden birds as well are prey species for a lot of larger predators, unfortunately, including domestic cats. So we've got some common species here. I'm sure you've seen these cold tit, the blue tit, the great tit. Uh, you know, you can put bird feeders for these guys to attract more of them into your garden. Again, make sure this bird feeder is kept away from any walls or trees that a cat could use to climb up and potentially kill some of these birds. Some other species here, the house sparrow, the wren, the robin. Uh, the robin is a very, very territorial bird. If you have a robin in your garden, the likelihood of you having more than one is very low because of this territorial nature. Any other um, bird, whether it be a male or a female, they will sing very loudly and they will puff up their chest, that red chest, to try and scare them off because they want the territory to themselves. And the, the only time that a female would let a male near them is uh, in the mating season. And here we have the wren, uh, the smallest bird, but also well, probably one of the loudest. It's got a very loud and very distinctive call. And um, I'll play it for you here because it's quite recognisable. You know what, I just need to check something.
yes, I did do that. Sorry, Johnny, I was just checking. I'd shared the sound, but I have. So those are our um, garden bird species, which can end up being prey species for the magpie. Magpies have got um, not a good reputation. They're very common. They are seen as scavengers as well as just plain savages for what they can do to other birds. They're actually highly, highly intelligent. Um, it's a bit of a myth that they are attracted to shiny things. There's actually no concrete evidence to show that they are more attracted to highly reflective objects more than other birds. Um, but it's a nice sort of little myth around them. Uh, they're seen as pretty much savages because of what they can do to other birds. They are known to raid nests and eat eggs and eat chicks. And I understand if you have watched, say, uh, a couple of blackbirds raise a nest uh, and then suddenly you find all the chicks have been uh, flayed on your lawn, you probably won't be that happy with the magpie, but the magpie is part of the ecosystem. It um, needs to survive. It's very important. And that's just the way the world works, unfortunately. Um, it's also a little bit of a myth that they are a huge threat to songbirds any more than domestic cats. They're probably much lower than domestic cats in their threats, but they are a very interesting bird. They're very intelligent. I know for sure, for sure where I live, uh, they are known to, if you leave your kitchen window open, they are known to pop into your kitchen and uh, steal anything that's on the side and fly out again. So they're very clever. Rats, I thought I'd cover rats because in the first webinar, I got asked the question about how you would attract the small mammals that you want to your garden, like field mice, without attracting rats. And the simple answer to that question is you can't. If you are putting out food and you're making your back garden an area that has got plenty of shelter, plenty of food, you will potentially attract rats. The important thing to remember about rats is that they are part of the ecosystem. They are also not a sign of uh, low sanitation and a dirty area. That's a common myth around rats. Rats will exist anywhere where there is abundance of food and shelter. And these areas don't necessarily have to be dirty areas. They are not dirty animals. You can find them perfectly normal in the wild. They can be in the woodland, they can be in the grassland, they can be in hedgerows. You might also find them in your garden. If you start putting things out like traps and poison, you could start affecting the other species you're trying to attract to your garden. If you want, if it's a, a problem such as they keep getting into your shed and eating things, damaging things, then you might need to think about um, better protecting stuff in your shed, double bagging things, that kind of thing. But the important thing is rats are a part of the ecosystem. They play a role and it's impossible to attract the species you want without attracting the species you don't want. Um, so they are important. So let's go on to some predators now. The Irish stoat. Uh, this is a subspecies of the European stoat. They are different. Um, and despite that very cute little appearance, they are actually ferocious predators and they will take prey many, many times their size. And they are very varied in their diet as well. They will take eggs. Uh, from bird's nests, they will take mice, they will take garden birds, and they will take large rabbits, like I will show you in this um, video. I think this is live for David Attenborough documentary, and this shows a stoat killing a rabbit 10 times its size, and it's pretty good. There you go, so not so cute and cuddly, they are ferocious little predators. So another predator I'm going to move on to is one of these classic recognisable mammals across the UK, and that is the fox. Uh, you will often see them in areas where, similar to rats, there's lots of food, there's lots of shelter. And those areas at the moment seem to be urban areas. So we have huge urban populations of foxes. The most common, obviously, and, and most popularly known are the foxes in London, the urban species in London. Um, this is just testament to their amazing variability on their survival they can manage in areas like that um, they're very adaptable omnivores their diet is so varied they can eat things like cabbages from people's allotments they've been seen taking pet fish from garden ponds they'll feed on earthworms they'll feed on fruit they'll feed on any waste from rubbish bins they'll feed on pigeons rabbits 
uh, and they'll also eat roadkill. And you can see here, if you've got chickens in your back garden, uh, you want to be very careful about the foxes that are around you. They're not protected by any sort of uh, animal rights laws, so farmers are freely allowed to shoot them if they believe they are a threat to their poultry stocks, for example. Uh, but despite this, they are still very um, abundant across Northern Ireland. So if we go on to um, birds of prey, the first one we're going to cover here is the classic peregrine falcon. They are the largest breeding falcon that you can find in Northern Ireland. Uh, they are found across a variety of different habitats. You can find them in lowland and upland rural areas, but they are also known to come into urban areas. An example of this is that a few years ago, there was a couple of peregrine falcons that were nesting on top of the Samson and Goliath cranes at the Belfast docks. So um, they are very variable in where they will nest. They are also seen on Cave Hill, I think, as well. And last year, Northern Ireland actually had a record-breaking nest. There were five chicks in one nest. Uh, and this is the largest um, brood produced in the UK by a peregrine falcon that's ever been seen. And the nest location, for obvious reasons, was kept secret. But the Northern Ireland Raptor Study Group, who I recommend you might want to check out after this webinar, uh, they monitored the nest and described it as a once in a lifetime. So that's a very special, I think. Those You can see the chicks down there who are obviously not particularly happy about having their picture taken. They look like that's probably the 20th picture someone's taken that day. And they're not very happy, but uh, an amazing thing for Northern Ireland to have hosted there. Peregrine falcons, their diet is usually medium sized birds, usually pigeons, things like that. And they are famous for being the fastest animal on the planet. That's because when they move into a stoop, which is a technique they use to hunt their prey that I'll show you in this video in just a second. Uh, in this stoop, they can reach about 200 miles per hour as they fly down and then they will try and knock the pigeon with their talons or punch it on the back of the head, knock it unconscious or just knock it playing dead in the air. They're known to do that as well, catch it and then go and eat it. So they are incredible birds. So this is just a little video from National Geographic about how the peregrine falcon will make its kill. So another quite common bird of prey that you'll see around Northern Ireland is the common buzzard. Now you'll usually spot these on top of fence posts or trees by the side of the road, usually in rural areas. They don't tend to come anywhere near urban areas. Um, you'll hear their call sometimes as well, this sharp shrieking call um, to each other. They're very versatile as well. Their diets, they are known to take things like frogs, toads, lizards, smaller birds, small mammals like the wood mouse, potentially rabbits and things like that. So um, they're not specialists. They will take anything that they can. Finally, the last bird of prey I wanted to introduce you to is the barn owl. And the barn owl is probably one of the other recognisable species of owls in the UK. A lot of people will know what they look like. They've got that classic heart-shaped face and the mottled brown and grey plumage on the back um, and they are usually seen around farming areas they will uh, roost in barns hence the name in old farm buildings and they will feed in the long grass areas you'll see them hunting in daytime as well as night hovering above areas of long grass looking for the wood mice maybe small rabbits things like that but in Northern Ireland, uh, the barn owl is under threat. You can see here from the NI Raptor study group, there's only an estimated 30 breeding pairs of barn owls left. So why? Why do we have such a decline? Uh, the main reason is thought to be a loss of habitat. Again, similar to the main causes of biodiversity loss that I covered at the start. Habitat loss is a huge problem. This is mainly the areas where the barn owl will forage. So these areas of long grass disappearing, which means that the barn owl doesn't have anywhere to forage, doesn't have anywhere to feed, and the population will start to decrease. They're also really vulnerable to road traffic accidents as well, being hit by cars and climate change as well is known as a, as a serious problem for them as their prey species start declining in population because of climate change as well. And accidental and deliberate poisoning. There have been incidents of deliberate poisoning on barn owls as well as accidental. Um, so you can see there on that photograph that the barn owl has been ringed because the numbers are so small. 
they're having to monitor them each individually. So that that one does have a ring on its on its leg. So yes, it's uh, quite sad that they are in such trouble in Northern Ireland. But you can put up uh, barn owl boxes, and if farmers can keep as much uh, land as they can with long grass to provide foraging areas for the barn owls, we might start to bring these numbers back up. So I'm just going to pause there before we move on to the next section about Northern Irish small mammals. And then from there, we will cover the uh, endemic small mammals to Northern Ireland, some of which are quite threatened. And we'll also cover some marine species as well. So I'll just pause there. OK, let's move on to part two of this presentation. Here we go. So Northern Irish small mammals, we're going to talk about some species which are found in Northern Ireland and some of which are actually quite threatened. So let's start this off with bats. As I spoke about before, there are about eight to nine species of uh, bat that can be commonly seen across Northern Ireland. Um, the most common of these species is the common pipistrel, which also happens to be the smallest bat. It only weighs about five grams, so a tiny little thing uh, with a wingspan of about 25 centimetres. So you can see here in the photo on the right, that's a roosting colony of bats. Pause this because of the noise. Sorry, I just had to pause it there because there's a lot of building work going on outside and there's a lot of noise. I might have to do that again. So I'm share my screen again and we'll go from the start. Nope. There. So Northern Irish small mammals, we're going to cover um, quite a few species that can be found across Northern Ireland, some of which are actually quite threatened. So it's important that we learn as much about them as possible. So let's start with bats. We have about eight species of bats across Northern Ireland. The most common species is the common pipistrel, which is also the smallest bat in Northern Ireland. It only weighs about five grams. So it's a tiny little thing with a wingspan of about 25 centimeters. Um, so we can see here in this photograph on the right, we have a roosting colony. This is what they will look like if they are inside someone's roof or a farm building. The size of these roosting colonies can vary greatly between species. Sometimes you can have hundreds, sometimes you only have maybe 20 or 30 species. Roosting uh, areas, are, or bat roosts, pardon me, are protected under law. It's a crime to disturb a roost. Even if there are no bats roosting in it at the time, if it's a known roost, uh, you cannot disturb it in any way. So. You can see here some bats can eat up to 3,500 insects in a single night. And this is really important to remember when we think about it in the context of ecosystem services and pest control. So ecosystem services, we've got pest control and now pollination covered by bats. Bats do pollinate over 500 species of plant. And these plants are usually tropical plants. Two of the most popular and common plants that they do pollinate are mangoes and bananas. So the next time you're in the supermarket buying a bunch of bananas, those bananas may only be there because of pollination through a bat. Uh, a lot of people do not think of bats as pollinators, but they are really, really important um, for pollination of different plants. They're also really important, as we mentioned before, for pest control, though, you know, a huge volume of small flying insects that they can consume every night, 3,500. Imagine if they were, did they just vanished tomorrow, those bats, the sheer amount of insects that we would have on top of the amount we have already. They are really, really important for pest control. Uh, so they are very, very important species to have around. And they feed on this huge number of insects through echolocation or biosonar, as we would call it. They will send out a burst of high frequency clicks um, from their larynx. And this burst of clicks goes out into the night and will bounce off perhaps any obstacles that it needs to be aware of, or importantly, a prey species, let's say, for example, a moth. And these uh, clicks will rebound off the, the moth and they will come back to the bat 
and the bat can uh, process the returning noises and use those returning noises to figure out what orientation that prey species is at in relation to the bat, the size, the speed that it's moving at. And it's really, really important for them to create a sort of map inside their head of where their prey species are and this allows them to hunt in pitch black darkness so the quick thing on identifying common seals and gray seals the two types of seal that you will see around northern ireland on the coastline and it's easiest to think of these two species as cats and dogs so the common seal is more cat-like as we would say it's just generally in uh, body size smaller the head is quite round, smaller head as well, very big eyes. The head looks more like a cat. I know it's quite a stretch, but it does. They're more cat-like small heads. The grey seal, on the other hand, we would describe as being more dog-like. It has a larger body mass in general. The males can get up to about 400 kilograms. They are very large. Uh, they have a longer sort of snout, bigger head and just more dog-like face in general. And the other way we can tell the difference is through the nostrils. So the common seal you can see here on the left has got a sort of Y-shaped nostril. They're very close together. The grey seal has got two distinct separate slits of the nostril. So hopefully you, uh, if you go out on the coast and you see some seals, it's quite hard if they are just swimming out in the sea to be able to tell. But if they are hauled out on the beach, you will be able to tell uh, what species of seal it is using these identification techniques. So the harbour porpoise I'm just going to cover next. It's uh, the most common cetacean. So the cetaceans are dolphins, porpoises and whales. The most common cetacean that you will see around Northern Irish waters. Uh, the harbour porpoise, the harbour name comes from the fact that you will often see them quite close to the shore. This is where they tend to stick quite close to harbours, quite close to bays. Um, the name uh, comes from the Latin word for porcus because they were known as the puffing pig due to the chuffing noise that they can make or puffing noise when they breach out of the water. So you might not see them, but you might hear them. Um, they will often be seen feeding, eating very large amounts of fish. This is because they need to regulate their body temperature. So if you are out on the coast, just look out for that little dorsal fin, the triangular dorsal fin. That might be a harbour porpoise out there. So gulls, I know they have a very bad reputation. If you've been trying to eat your chips down on the coast or down on the beach, you will not be long until you've got plenty of these gulls coming around and um, nagging you for a chip, maybe trying to nick one themselves. Uh, but they are really important for the ecosystem. Again, they are a nuisance, but they are super important. The first reason why they are important is that they are what we would call an indicator species. Because they are an apex predator and they are at the top of their food chain, any decline in their population usually reflects a further problem in the food chain under the water where it's harder for us to see. So if we notice that, say, the population of herring gulls in an area has hugely declined, it can indicate that there are some other problems, say, with the fish species below the sea. And they're also really important for the transfer of nitrogen uh, using their poo onto the coast. So their guano or their poo or their droppings will be transferred onto the coast and is really good for vegetation because nitrogen is really important for plant growth. Cormorants and guineots, these are two other types of seabird that you will commonly see. The cormorant is on the left. They've got this sort of prehistoric look about them, very reptilian. Uh, they hold their wings out in this way because their feathers are not waterproof, so they need to dry them off using air and wind. So you will commonly see them sat on fence posts or walls or in trees near the coastline with their wings out in this fashion to keep them uh, nice and dry. The guillemot is on the right. Uh, guillemots are actually on the amber list for Northern Ireland for protection because they are very vulnerable to uh, pollution in the ocean, especially oil spills. Oil spills will coat their feathers, takes away the waterproof uh, element of those feathers, which makes them more vulnerable to things like hypothermia. Uh, and they will also spend a lot of time preening any oil out of their feathers to the point where they actually stop eating because they are preening their feathers so much and they are really vulnerable to this. So the last uh, animal I wanted to share with you today is uh, 
in my opinion, probably one of the most incredible bird species we have around here it is the Arctic tern, also known as the sea swallow. This is due to the tail feathers or the streamers. It's got uh, these, these, they form a V shape and make it do look like a, a, a swallow. So they are very special visitors to Northern Ireland in the summer. Uh, this is because of the huge distances that they will travel to get here. Uh, the Arctic tern has got the longest migration of all animals. They can cover a round trip distance of about 35,000 kilometers per year, essentially just cycling back and forth from the Antarctic to the Arctic. Uh, their migration occurs between the Arctic summer and then the Ar Antarctic summer, which also means that they uh, see the most daylight of any animal on Earth. So you can see here on this map, they will have their wintering grounds down in the Antarctic before coming up, having some food in the Arctic, breeding, and then coming back down. So they will arrive at the breeding sites on the northern coastline of Northern Ireland in uh, early summer. They might lay about one to three eggs, uh, feed on small fish and sand eels in the, in the sand and in the water. Uh, and then at the end of the summer, after their chicks have been born, they will leave and they will fly down over Europe and down the coast of Africa and down to the Antarctic in time for their summer. Um, the Arctic tern is a species example, which is what I was talking about before, about vulnerability of species in the food chain. They are incredibly vulnerable to a decline in the food sources they have. So an example of this is that in 2004, uh, there was a crash in the population of sand eels, these tiny little uh, eels which live in the, the beaches and the sands and they will dip through with their beaks to try and eat them. There was a crash in the population of these eels uh, and at the time the scientists didn't know why but now we recognize it was because of climate change that this decline was. This decline reflected heavily on the Arctic Tern because in some areas their breeding sites around the northern coast of Northern Ireland and in Scotland as well there was a complete failure for re of reproduction. No chicks survived, especially in the Shetland Islands. Usually they will have about 20,000 pairs breeding in the Shetland Islands. Not a single chick survived that year. So it just sort of reinforces that point of just how vulnerable some species can be to just small changes. Things that may seem insignificant to us can have a huge impact on other species and it would be such a shame if that was to happen again and we were to lose these incredible visitors, these long distance uh, migrators. So that is our final slide here, that's our final animal. I hope, I will stop sharing now. That was our final animal there. Uh, I hope you um, found this session interesting, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you've got any questions please feel free to try and contact me. Um, and yeah, I hope you enjoyed it.